an early pe uh, peak for five minutes. So, uh, you know, want to welcome our panelists here. You're gonna, we're going to do it formally on radio and uh, on television in just a few minutes, about four and a half minutes from now. But uh, live stream folks, welcome. Welcome back for many of you. And uh, this is behind the scenes. So um, we've been singing the praises and also uh, doing the opposite of singing the praises of certain <laughs> cities in Canada. <laughs> But that was that was the pre-party, bro. That's all you. That was the pre-party. So you missed right all of that. that. <laughs> um, yeah. We, that uh, wasn't recorded. That doesn't exist. No, that doesn't exist. It's it's gone. Happen. No. It's gone. I mean, at the end of the day, we love this country. I think that's what we came yeah. to right before this live stream started, right? Yes, sir. It's uh, and we miss traveling quite a bit. I think everybody probably misses traveling. I don't know how much traveling you were doing, Rosie, with your work. You were. Pretty, it was a morning show here in Toronto before you left to Ottawa Yeah, as well. and, then, and then I made a, a documentary on uh, the great jazz great Oliver Jones, and I mm. well, had the arduous task of traveling to Barbados. Oh, it was, oh, 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 it was really tough, and oh, you know. Oh. So I, travel was just a part of my life, yeah. and for a solid year, plane, what plane? Nothing, right? It's, mm. it's wow, what a difference. Yeah. What a difference, I mean, um, being able to just come and go and see the world is, I didn't realize what a privilege that right. was. I just took it for granted. I mean, I, you know, I'm an athlete, I ran track and represented Canada. So you just pack your bags in the summer, you're all over Europe. And uh, that's what I grew up with. And now for a year, stay home. And Rosie Stay ran home. to Europe. A lot of people don't know that, but she ran directly to <laughs> Europe. That's how that I got my warm-up in. Yeah, that's how I got yeah, my yeah, warm-up in. That was in. just your uh, <laughs> jog around the, uh, around the track. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Paul, were you traveling a fair amount too? I was, a lot more because of, of a, what I was doing, just for work. Yeah. Uh, I, I hate traveling. I hate it. Like the whole process of traveling. Well, because I'm not doing it for fun. Usually I'm doing it for work. Right. Right. And traveling for fun versus traveling for work, two completely different things. And uh, I like the for me like the stay at home order was just like because that's that's what I do in between gigs like I'm home I'm in my basement I'm doing things that's I, I'm a very very much a homebody and mm. I I was surrounded by the people I love the most yeah you know and so I mean not to say that the edges aren't fraying now because it's been a little <laughs> while yeah and yeah right. okay my oldest is starting to take up more room because he's getting bigger but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the whole process of traveling, yeah. it, it, it could be, it was exciting for like two whole minutes. And then after that, I get homesick. Um, oh man, oh. I just and love to hit the road. I'm, a, <laughs> yeah. I'm the opposite. <laughs> Work, pleasure, it doesn't matter. As long right. as I'm leaving, I like it. Yeah, yeah. My wife even, we have a great thing where my wife says, you come back, uh, you come back reset and more focused on wow. the family. I'm like, great. <laughs> Am I? I didn't know that. That's good news. That's good news for all of us. That's good. Um, yeah, not to say I don't miss the kids, but man, I really... Traveling for the last four years, traveling around the country was really it was top notch. Meeting yeah. really, really good people. I mean, the experience itself of seeing different places is fantastic. Like, I love that yeah. too. What but you hate is people. The actual, absolutely <laughs> no. It's the actual process of it. Like, the the convenience of flying is great. The process is not as much sure. fun. Sure. Sitting in a pressurized tube, thirty thousand feet in the air, with like everybody squeezed in like that, it's not my favorite. Kind okay. of, you know, way to pass the time. Yeah. Traveling during COVID is not fun. I've yeah. had to yeah, travel this year, well, last year in 2020, to Oklahoma, where there is no 14-day quarantine, where they, <laughs> like, don't mm -hmm. really wear masks. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also in L.A. in, like, late November, and I ended up withdrawing from an episode of something, but it ended up being canceled anyway because all of L.A. got shut down. Right. So it's, like, it's a stressful time traveling. You're I'm like, I miss traveling... Before COVID, right. I've been yeah. traveling this year and it's not fun. <laughs> it's tough in a, that pressurized tube thing, you know, how dry it gets in planes yeah. and you're like covered up and like, oh, if I cough in this plane, I'm like, I'm like worse than a terrorist well, right but now. I'm, I'm basically. <laughs> Coughing is you farting in public. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just phlegm. I don't have. People are like, oh. Even after <laughs> all this, I still miss flying. I really? I do. I do. I'm, just, I'm broken. No, I no, I totally do also. I just miss travel. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I miss Me too. Okay, 12, oh 10 seconds oh to the show. <laughs> have fun, everybody. Good luck. Whew. This original CBC program is available in described video. What is the one book that all of Canada should read? 
That is what you are here to find out. Five celebrated Canadi Canadians are here with me. Each of them has chosen a book that will transport us. Over the next four days, your panel will narrow this list down from five titles to one, and that book will be your winner. It's the great Canadian book debate. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Hello and welcome. It's the 20th edition of Canada Reads. We've been doing this for 20 years. Speaking of years, it feels like the pandemic has been going on for several, <laughs> but it has only been one, but it has been a tough one. Many of you have gone without seeing loved ones, without going to your favorite restaurant, or getting a haircut. I shave my head daily, but it doesn't feel like the right time to rub that in anyone's face. It has been a tough time for many people, and Canada Reads is here to provide you with some entertainment, a respite, an escape. And this year, things do look a little bit different. There is no live audience joining us this year. Uh, all five panelists have joined me in studio, but instead of sitting around that Canada Reads poker table that everyone has come to love, everyone has their own mini table this year. We're sitting in a large circle, six feet apart, and we are following COVID protocols. And we may be physically apart, but we are coming together to do something that I know I love to do, to discuss and celebrate great literature. And our panel loves to do that too. And that's why they're all here. And they want to do the same thing we've done 19 times before. They're here to choose the one book all of Canada should read. It's a big job, but they are up for the challenge. Let's meet them now. On my left is your first panelist. He's probably the nicest and nerdiest guy <laughs> on Canadian television, proudly nerdy. He's the star of the CBC TV show, Kim's Convenience. You may have also seen him on the Disney Plus show, The Mandalorian, or hosting Canada's Smartest Person Junior. Welcome to Canada Reads, Paul Sunhyung Lee. Hi, Paul. Hello. How are you? Nervous. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I just <laughs> want to take this moment to remind you that uh, I am the host of this show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been in a lot of films and a lot of TV shows. Tell us which character are you channeling for Canada Reads? Oh, gosh. I didn't even think about that. Uh, maybe I should have. I'd feel a lot more comfortable if it was up, up here, sort of championing Hench. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if he'd like Hench, though, but I think, I, I'm, I'm sure he'd be a little bit confused because he might be like, yeah, I don't understand a book about a superhero. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's uh, not a Superman, but uh, supposed to be Superman. <laughs> but a uh, is a hero? I don't understand, huh? But uh, I have a fun time reading. Uh, maybe I should have done that. It would, but... been a, it would have been a miserable debate for everybody else <laughs> to debate Appa based on what I know about Appa. But nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Tell us about the book you are champion, actually. Let's yeah. Have that, uh, it you is... can hold that up and Yes, uh, this is Hench know. by Natalie Zina Walshots. This is her first novel, and this is a genre-bending book. It's fantastic. It takes the point of view of uh, the lesser-known characters in a lot of these sort of genre books, in this case, uh, of the henchmen or the henches, the, the lesser sort of supporting characters for the villains. All right, we'll give you some time to talk uh, at length about that. Thank you, Paul. Next to Paul is uh, your second panelist. She lives for a little competition. She's a three-time Olympian who held the Canadian record in the 400 meter hurdles for over 20 years. She's also an accomplished broadcaster, currently the host of CTV Morning Live in Ottawa. Welcome to Canada Reads, Rosietta. Hello. Rosie, how are you? Oh, I, I'm nervous too. Um, this is exciting. <laughs> this is um, meaningful. This is necessary. Folks I... are at home. They're like, what am I going to do? Another day. I got to stay inside. Hey, you know, why don't you get lost in a book? Sure. You know? And uh, I do. is this a good time to remind you that there are no gold medals at Canada Reads? <laughs> is, are you okay with that? Okay, no gold medals. <laughs> yeah. um, it's too late to leave, Rosie. But there's, yeah, but there's probably like just bragging rights that you can you can claim. You definitely and, can do and, that. In a sense of accomplishment after and a job well done. Tell us about the uh, the <laughs> job well done you'll be doing uh, for for this book. Tell yeah, us about the book. I'm championing the Midnight Bargain. Isn't it just like a beautiful cover? Well, guess what? <laughs> when you open it up, you just 
are immersed in an, in an even more fulfilling, vitally detailed, rich um, tale full of love and adventure. I will get to you, yes. that whole no, yeah, pitch. No, we'll have lots no of pitches. time. Yeah. We'll have yeah. lots yeah. of time for you to... Uh, <laughs> To explain that, sitting across from me <laughs> is your third panelist. He knows how to make great music. He's a Juno-nominated singer-songwriter. His hits included include Kinda Complicated, Hang Ups, PDA, and Bungalow. He has toured with Tegan and Sarah, Shawn Mendes, Walk Off the Earth, Vance Joy. Welcome to Canada Reads, Scott Hellman. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you here. I have heard good problems every day last week, and uh, now I'm here with you. All week long, I just can't get away from you, Scott. It's, I'm, I'm, You're yeah. everywhere. You're omnipresent. I am. <laughs> One of your big songs is called "Everything Sucks." Yes. <laughs> Does everything suck about Canada Reads right now? Are you? No, because I got to read this amazing book, <laughs> right. and I get to be with such such wicked people. Well, tell us about yeah. this book. Um, this is an amazing book called Two Trees Make a Forest" by Jessica J. Lee. Um, it is it is a beautiful book. Um, it, it brought me right back to nature. Um, and it reminded me of what's important, you know, finding yourself and and uh, and connecting back with with the earth. So, Great. all right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. Next to Scott is your fourth panelist. She's an actor and a filmmaker with a bright future. In fact, the Toronto International Film Festival named her a rising star in 2018, and she can be seen in the TV shows American Gods, Cardinal, and The Order, and the film Rhymes for Young Ghouls. Her next big role will be in Taika Waititi series, Reservation Dogs. Welcome to Canada Reads, Devry Jacobs. Hey. Nyamoko for having me. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and also a little bit nervous. I want to do my book justice. Well, tell us about, because you've been in, in, in a number of movies and films. Uh, you're a filmmaker as well. There's usually a script involved when you work on TV. There's no script on Canada Reads. I oh. have a script, but you guys don't. You have a script. We don't have a <laughs> exactly. script. Exactly. Are this you is ready? way more vulnerable than uh, acting is on screen for me, but it's something that I'm really excited about and I'm up to the challenge. Uh, I'm championing Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead, which is a beautiful debut novel. Uh, it really touched me and has helped guide me through life as well as through Canada Reads. And in it, I really want to walk hand in hand with uh, with Johnny, who, as the author explained to me, um, in Cree culture, stories are animate beings. And so Johnny is real, and I feel him with me today in championing this book. Great. Thank you very much, Devery. <laughs> All right, your final panelist <laughs> at the table. Good, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next to me on my right, we have completed the circle. He is complimenting Devery Jacobs right now. He is comfortable on TV, on stage, and in the kitchen. He's a chef known for hosting the shows Man, Fire, Food, and Everyday Exotic. He's also been on Top Chef Canada, Chopped, and Good Morning America. Welcome to Canada Reads, Roger Mooking. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, it doesn't look like you brought any uh, delicious food uh, to bribe your fellow panelists with. I'm personally disappointed by that. But you are very comfortable turning up the heat in the kitchen. Uh, are you comfortable in the uh, hot seat of Canada Reads? Uh, yeah, you know, I I've, I've, don't know everybody on this panel. Rosie, I've crossed many times over the years. So it's a really interesting opportunity just to kind of get to know everybody in these really odd circumstances, you know? Absolutely. Tell us about the book that you'll be championing. All right, so I'm championing this book called Butter, Honey, Pig Bread. And the title obviously drew me as a chef. <laughs> uh, although food is very central to this book, um, it's not what keeps me with this book. This book is so dense, so powerful, has so many layers to it, is so incredibly poetic and lyrical. Um, it's one of the best books I've read in my life, and I think that's why Canadians need to read it. Great. Excited to hear more about it. Thank you, Roger. Those are your Canada Reads 2021 panelists. Okay. Paul, Rosie, Scott, Devery, and Roger. Canada Reads, I'll explain to you, uh, if you don't know already, it's like a courtroom, but you are both the lawyers and the jury. <laughs> like a good lawyer, you're going to start by making an opening argument or an opening statement. So you'll have 60 seconds to make your case for why the book that you are championing should be the winner of Canada Reads 2021. And when your time is up, I'll ring this small but mighty Canada Reads bell. We're going to go around the room. It's going to be in the same order in which we did the introductions. Consistency for the audience, and it helps me as well. Paul, you are on my left. That means you are going first. 
You are, as you said, championing the novel Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. Let's have a listen to the trailer. Anna is a hench. She crunches data for supervillains. It's just office work, a way to pay the bills. But when she gets injured on the job, because of the biggest superhero in town, she gets mad. How many other people have been hurt by superheroes? How many jobs lost? Homes destroyed? Lives ruined? Anna decides to find out and discovers that superheroes aren't so super after all. She becomes a hench on the rise, working for the baddest villain of all. <laughs> How far can she climb? How far will she fall? Paul, you have 60 seconds. Why is Hench the one book that all of Canada should read? After the absolute dumpster fire of the last year, I can totally understand why the theme this year is one book to transport us all. And I'm not gonna talk about how Hench is a fresh and subversive look on the tired tropes of the superhero genre. I'm not gonna talk about the razor sharp humor and wit of this novel or the incredibly believable and inclusive and diversive group of characters that live within its pages or the themes that run deep and resonate long after this story is told. I'm gonna talk about how much fun this book was to read. I mean, fun. Um, there is a palpable and infectious joy in the storytelling that happens between the pages of this novel and that joy manifests itself within the reader. Hench is a book that reminds me of why I started reading for fun in the first place. And yes, the book is entertaining and accessible, but the craft, the style, the panache of the writing is something that shouldn't be dismissed simply because it's fun. If you want to be transported, if you want to have fun, pick up Hench, buckle up, you'll enjoy the ride. Thank you, Paul. Rosie, it's your turn. You're championing the novel The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk. Check this out. Beatrice Claiborne lives in a land of magic and mystery but also a land of rigid social rules and expectations. As a woman, she must marry well to help her family, but that's not what she wants. She wants to practice magic, which is illegal and dangerous for married women to do. Beatrice will do anything to make her dream come true, including hunting down a special book to help her, working with her rival, making a deal with a spirit, and possibly giving up true love forever. Rosie, 60 seconds are on the clock, which is interesting. Uh, it's more time than it took you to run those 400-meter hurdles. I will start with the bell. Why is The Midnight Bargain the one book all of Canada should read? The Midnight Bargain is the one book all of Canada should read because Canada, we deserve a win. It's been a year of wrestling with a restless, relentless virus, debilitating uncertainty, and social isolation. C.L. Polk delivers a sweeping tale of love, adventure, self-love, and self-determination, all vividly enveloped in a transportive world of magic. Beatrice Claiborne practices magic in secret, dreading the day she will be forced to marry well and wear a marital collar, which will dim her world and strip her of her power to create magic. Her relentless quest for freedom opens a portal of hope. When she finds a grimoire and an unlikely pair of fellow truth seekers, they embark on a thought-provoking, fantastic journey filled with delicious tension and subversive actions that challenge classism, sexism, and the status quo. C.L. Polk compels us to wade through the murky, heavy waters of self-doubt and emerge triumphantly liberated. Thank you, Rosie. Scott, you're across from me. It is, uh, it is your turn. You're championing the nonfiction book, Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee. Here's the trailer. Jessica J. Lee grew up in Canada, but her grandparents were from Taiwan. It was a world and a family forgotten. Or so Jessica thought. But after her Paul and Gong pass away, Jessica's mother finds a letter written by Gong about his life before. Jessica goes to Taiwan to be in nature, to hike and swim and travel. To learn about Taiwan, its land, 
and history, to unearth memories and make new ones, a place new and old, while discovering a country familiar yet foreign, a place that was home. Scott, 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Two Trees Make a Forest the one book all of Canada should read? Two Trees Make a Forest is the one book all of Canada should read because this is the book to help us rebu rebuild our spirits and our earth. Um, through the voice of careful observation and passionate love, Lee finds her footing in a land that she hopes may offer her a glimpse of her family's past and covering truths about herself along the way. Within this book and through its themes, colonialism, identity, loss, indigenous rights, environmentalism, family, and home, Lee takes use of her learned understanding of environmental history to lay the foundation of a journey which is not only useful, but essential. For one, the understanding of one's place in the world is a universal struggle, and within the multicultural landscape of Canada, it is even more so. Maybe more importantly, though, is the environmental lens through which this book dissects the painful crossroads a diaspora, a family, and an individual must face. The merging of nature and humanity has never been of higher importance, and Two Trees Makes a Forest does not reach for this truth. It knows it intimately. When we do emerge from our caves and begin to rebuild our world once again, Lee's knowledge of the natural world as the source of humanity and its stories will become an essential tool to all who read it. Within the theme of one book to transport us, I can think of no better book than this book. Thank you, Scott. All right, Devery, you're next. You're championing the novel Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead. Here's the trailer. Johnny Appleseed is an Indian glitter princess. That's what he calls himself. He left the res and is now living in the city. He pays his bills with sex work. Things are tough, but Johnny is tougher. His community in the city is small, but tight knit. But when his stepfather dies, it's time to return to the res. Face his memories, his history, his mother. Because looking back is the only way forward. And love is what he needs most. It's there, if he opens himself up to it. Every 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Johnny Appleseed the book that all of Canada should read? Author Joshua Whitehead is a master of words and Johnny Appleseed is a profound, visceral and healing novel that feels like home. Reading it, I was transported into Johnny's body in a sensory feast and experienced each of his memories physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Throughout his life, Johnny is a pain eater. He takes the hurt and the misfortune he's experienced and he spins them into biting humor and beauty. Every word in Johnny Appleseed is poetic and charged with intimate honesty, all balanced with res humor and the perfect dose of cheekiness. Johnny Appleseed is undoubtedly a novel that needs to be read, reread, and cherished. It captures the heart, trauma, resilience, and boundless love that two-spirit folks, indigenous queers, and the women of our communities. When first reading Johnny Appleseed, I originally thought that the book was good medicine, but now I understand that Johnny is here to remind us that we are our own best medicine. With three seconds to spare, thank you, Devery Jacobs. All right, Roger, you're next to me, on my other side. Perhaps Paul is the angel on my shoulder. You're the devil. I guess we'll find <laughs> out this week. Uh, you're last but not least. You're championing the novel Butter, Honey, Pig, read by Francesca Equiasi. Let's have a listen. Three Nigerian women. A mother, Kamburi Nachi, and her twin daughters, Kengide and Taye. Kamburi Nachi was born a Nogbanje, a spirit, a soul who causes misfortune and misery to all she loves. Kenide and Taye are sisters connected by fate, separated by trauma, driven apart, cast to different corners of the world. But an appetite for food, a sprinkling of faith, and an abundance of love sets the table for togetherness, <laughs> healing, and forgiveness. Roger, you have 60 seconds. Why is Butter, Honey, Pig Bread the one book all of Canada should read? All right, so I could tell you here that um, 
You know, there's a book about two sisters who are estranged. They're twins. They're Nigerian. They've transported to Halifax and Montreal and, and different parts of Nigeria. I can tell you that they have a mother who's an Ogbanje, which is a folklore of the Igbo people. That's a, It's a curse that perpetuates families and that she has these personal, um, physical and spiritual responsibilities as an Ogbanje to the family. I could sit here and tell you about the horrifying traumas that we've all read in this book, and I don't want to give away too much, and that take you to the lowest lows, but also to the, the beauteous heights that life all has in it, right? I'm not going to attempt to mansplain or, as a father of four daughters, mansplain or explain queer love to you, but queer love is central to this book. I'm not going to tell you how sensuous the food is in this book, because <laughs> at the core of it, all of those things are layers just about humanity. This is a book about humanity, and it forces me to think about the community. And Thank that you, is Roger. what it's about. All right. Those are the titles in the running for Canada Reads 2021. Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots, championed by Paul Sun Young Lee. The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk, championed by Rosie Etta. Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee, championed by Scott Hellman. Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead, championed by Devery Jacobs, and Butter Honey Pig Bread by Francesca Equiasi, championed by Roger Mooking. One of these books will win by the end of the week, and one of them will be eliminated today. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. It's time to debate. Different types of books draw in different readers, and the books on Canada Reads this year are all very different. We have a science fiction book, fantasy, nonfiction, literary fiction. Canada Reads is about finding one book that the entire country should read. So we just played the trailers. We heard your opening statements. So we have a sense of what these titles are about and why you chose to champion them. There will be some readers who heard all of that and said, no, nah, I don't think that I would like that kind of thing. I don't think that I would read that. So I want to ask you this. What is it about your book that would appeal to readers who wouldn't normally pick up this kind of book? Rosie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to start off with the, the linear narrative, which structurally is just so beautifully written. And, and you can take this book and read page one, and from that first page, you are completely immersed. You put it down and uh, you have to run around and take care of the kids because we're in the middle of a lockdown. You pick it up wherever you are, you are simply retransported back into that world. And it's a strong linear narrative. And the character development, the vivid details, immerse you, transport you, take you to this world. Because we need that escape and that's what this book um, offers. C.L. Polk, she's, it's a perfect construct for immersive, fully enjoyable, thought-provoking reading. It's immersive and it's subversive. It has feminist themes that make everyone think, and the, and the protagonist, Beatrice, is, is an individual in which you can identify with because it's about self-determination. Yes, there's magic, and there's beautiful magic, and you might think, ah, oh, it's fantasy, it might be a bit youthful, um, but think of Think of um, Alice in Wonderland. Think of The Bridge to Terabithia. Think of um, all these types of novels with these serious undertones and really thought-provoking themes. This is where that book goes, and it takes you there in, in such a whirlwind of beauty and grace and magic and love and adventure. It's deep, it's immersive, and, uh, but it goes down very, very um, magically and, and, and beautifully because the author is really evoking this sense of self-determination and it's truly about you make the world in which you want to live in through your mind the magic is the mat is a power of thought the power of self-determination roger let me ask you what is it about your book that would appeal to readers who normally wouldn't pick up something like that you know like in my intro i was stating like there's all these things that i don't phys personally relate to I'm not of Nigerian descent. I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community. There's so many things, right? But somehow, magically, this woman, Francesca, has such a gift for writing. She's able to draw us in, no matter who you are. 
to the hum human aspects of all of these situations, right? There's trauma, there's the most retching trauma in this book, but there's also this blinding hope in this book. And I think all of the circumstances are important, but they're almost superfluous to the context of what this is about. Everybody walks through life day to day and life happens to them. You may have a plan, okay, I'm gonna go catch the bus at 8, 10, and get to work by 9 o'clock, and blah, 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 blah. But then in the midst of that, life happens. Boom, so you get hit by a truck and your father might die. It transforms your life in an instant. And what I love about this book is, although I can't relate to all of the nuances of it, I'm drawn to the humanity of it. And there's something that draws it and connects it together very primally. And for me as a chef, it is of utmost importance. She tells the story of that connection of the community and the familial bonds through food. You know, there's something very primal about this book, right? Food is so central to it. Sex is so central to it. Love is so central to it, right? Those are primal human elements. So whatever the nuances of those things may be, I'm left with this lingering thought, notion, and I keep questioning the lowest of the lows and the highest of the highs. And it sticks with me, you know, I haven't read a book in such a long time that's made me think every day about it in some way. What is love? How is love? How is madness? What is madness? What is community? What is, all of these things, and I think, and it makes me ponder, and I keep going back, and there are answers in the book. But what I do love is that there's this lingering notion. Nothing is fully resolved, as though you know, life is just gonna continue to happen to you again tomorrow. Nothing's neatly packaged, and I love that about it. It's just honest. I get the feeling you can speak passionately for quite a while about this book, Roger. But as we, <laughs> I could, I could. with our with our limited time, I want to make sure all of you get a chance to uh, to discuss your books in this way. Devery, let me ask you, what is it about this book that would appeal to readers who normally wouldn't pick this up? I mean, this is obviously a really specific community, and I would ask readers, when is the last time you read about indigenous queer two spirit love and sex and relationships? That's it's rarely happened, and that's precisely why Canada needs to read it. I think Joshua's words are so beautiful and poetic throughout it, but also he can find the beauty in the everyday. If you read one of the scenes where there's a pigeon that makes a nest across from his apartment, but it makes this beautiful home out of garbage, and that's actually like a reflection of, of what Johnny's doing throughout the book. Um, and I think that's precisely what we need in 2021 is finding all of the cracks in light and what this horrible situation of the pandemic is. It's also, uh, it's also really fun and filled with humor, even though there is discussion of trauma and of some unfortunate things that happened to Johnny throughout the book. It's still so beautiful and so filled with love and it doesn't damage him as a character and as a person. Um, and also, I just really appreciated all of the different pop culture references throughout it. I think it engages people and, and it's through its specificity of this specific community of Johnny, of this culture, that people and audiences will be able to find the universality of it. Scott, let me go to you next. What are your thoughts? If somebody saw the book, didn't want to pick it up, how, what would you tell them? Of my book? Or, yes. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about Two Trees Make a Forest is that, you know, when I was reading it, like, I'm not a woman, I'm not from Taiwan, um, and, and I was so inspired by this story of, of, a, of a person trying to find their place in the world. And I think that's, that's translatable to every Canadian. You know, whether or not you're, you're, you know, you've been in this country for generations or you're a brand new immigrant um, or you're an indigenous person. Like, I think everybody in this country can um, relate to the story of someone trying to figure out who they are and where they come from and, and what it means to be them. Um, and I think the other aspect of this book that's so, so urgently important is the environmental aspect of it. And, you know, I think we've been in our homes for... However long, I can't even remember the last time I, I felt like free of this, of this time, of this, this, uh, the constraints of COVID-19. And, you know, to be able to read this, this person's story of um, transcending and finding themselves and going out into nature and discovering the beauty of the earth, that's something I know I yearn for in this time. Um, and although I can take my dog for a walk in the park, man, do I yearn to, to really discover nature and discover my place in it. So um, I think that... 
for those two reasons alone, this book is so um, transmittable to every Canadian, and, and I, that's why I believed in it in the first place. So. Okay. Thank you, Scott. We have two minutes left for this section. Paul, I want you to uh, take that two minutes and, and tell us why somebody should pick up Hench, and then we can, you know, sink our teeth into some debate about this. Sure. I think, you know, a lot of times genre novels sort of get the short end of the stick and they're dismissed as being lesser than just because they're genre novels and they talk about different themes and, and, and things that, are, that we don't take quite seriously. It's like a novel about superheroes, science fiction, why bother? It's too light for me. Um, but one of the lovely things about Hench and one of the things I really, really discovered, other than the fact that Natalie Zeno Walshots is a fantastic author who's got cutting humor and is a very talented storyteller, is the accessibility of this book. Hench, um, in terms of having creating characters that are from all walks of life, was something that I was drawn to. Uh, a lot of times I feel like um, I'm underrepresented or communities are underrepresented. And here we have a book where all these characters that, that are there from different ethnicities, from different sexual orientations, from the different uh, gender identities, they're all part of this novel. And you can't help but feel included in all of that when you read about them. That she's created a world that's very, very similar to ours. And she's disguised a fantastically subversive tale with something that is very, very familiar for us. Uh, the world of superheroes in this book is very much like our, our world right now. There's social media. There are people who are struggling to, to succeed in life. There are, um, there just have to be fantastical things happening at the same time. And they're all made utterly believable because the themes she, she draws from this book are believable and there's something that we're dealing with nowadays as well. The, the whole theme of accountability, of the corruption of power, of uh, people un just completely um, deferring to, to authority without questioning judgment. That's, these are things that, that are really in the fabric of our society right now and that we're dealing with, but it's done in an entertaining way. And the best form of storytelling is something that can make you think about current issues in a very gentle, but. A, uh, uh, an accessible and open way. And that's, that's what Hench does. It, it really, really, it makes you have these, you can have these great discussions and talk about these difficult subjects because it's a great gateway in terms of, of raising these issues and having fun discussions about them as well. Okay, great. Um, let's, uh, let me ask you, Scott, ah. because you have a mem, <laughs> you have a, well, you have the only, usually we have a lot of memoirs. You have a, a, a book that is, part memoir, mm -hmm. and, and you know, Paul has mentioned a couple of times that his book is accessible. How accessible did you find Hench? I, I liked Hench. There were, there were things about Hench that I really liked. The thing that I found tough with Hench was there, there was this overarching theme of relativism in that book. And what I mean by that is, you know, this, this main character, she, she comes to these conclusions about um, good and evil based on her own sort of version of math. And, and however, however good that math, math might be, it's very hard to say it was corroborated by like serious, sci rigorous scientific evidence. And, and I just felt like I, when the book ended and she got her way, I felt really, I didn't feel filled with joy or filled with any sort of resolution. I felt sort of empty. And I felt like the message of the book was like, Good and bad, who knows the answer. Um, so I just, I don't know if it uplifted me. I, I, I can't say that, the, the, the other big thing for me was the, the, the aspect of transportation with Hench. Like, Hench was very much focused in this virtual world of social media and, um, you know, and I, I just found that's the world I was already living in, in COVID. Um, so, for those Except there reasons. no flying superheroes? <laughs> What's that? No, no flying superheroes going by your doorway? <laughs> well, sure, but, but you know, I, I don't know. The, the superhero aspect of it took a, a, a backseat for me to the virtual world, to the social media, to the, you know, number game. And, and I found that was already the world I was living in due to COVID. But that's so. what I loved about it. The fact that they took these things that are so concrete and so real and so relevant to us nowadays, and they put a fantastical spin on it. I mean, you talk about the use of data, predictive analysis, analytics, and sports, and anything that are that are happening right now, it's all data driven. And the whole idea of good versus evil is supposed to be muddy. It's not binary. It's not this is like extremes. It's messy. And that's what I loved about Hench is the fact that it's it deals with the fact that we give superheroes and these guys that are doing great good a free pass because they're doing great good, but we don't really question 
the collateral damage that happens. I mean, you see anything nowadays in the movies, these superhero movies, where entire buildings and cities get destroyed and nobody cares about the people like, I saved my entire life to buy this condo and a superhero wrecked it to, to stop a <laughs> bank robbery, right? You don't talk, like that's never ever sort of taken into account. And that's what I love about Natalie when she writes this story. It is, hey, let's look at the real sort of issue behind, like the, the numbers that she crunched were actually based on real math from a guy that did um, the predictive, the, the insurance adjustments for a lot of these natural events. And so she sat down, she did the research on that. And it's actually closer than you, you would imagine. And that's, for me, I, I love that. I read that, I learn something from it. Okay. It's, it. It really illuminates that and it gets you thinking, you can have these great discussions about the merits of, well, it's a math. I mean, you can always look at data and data can always get skewn or, or, or readjusted in to, to sort of favor whatever point of view you want to have. But that's another discussion all too. Right. Paul, let's Brother. leave it there so that we can move on and have another round. But uh, thank you all. That is it for this round. All right, panelists, Canada Reads is a competition and a book will be crowned the winner at the end of the week, but there's no cash prize uh, or trophy for the winning panelists. So your big reward other than glory is, uh, is up to the authors. Let's listen to this. If the Midnight Bargain wins Canada Reads, I will continue the tradition that we have in publishing of presenting the winner with flowers after their win, because it was the happiest moment for me when I won the World Fantasy Award to come home and have flowers delivered by my agent and my editor to say, yay, flowers for you, Rosie, tell me your favorite. If Johnny Appleseed wins Canada Reads, Devery, first and foremost, congratulations. You have won a crown and scepter <laughs> from Fierce Drake Jewels, a year's worth of supply of Anastasia Beverly Hills makeup, <laughs> and $100,000 because you are this year's winner of Canada Reads. Congratulations. I love you, Gisa Gitin. If Two Trees Make a Forest wins Canada Reads, I will personally take Scott Hellman on my favorite hike in Taiwan. I know he wants to go and take him to my favorite night market and buy him all of the best foods and, and hopefully just show him a really good time there. I really hope he would enjoy it as much as he's enjoyed the book. If Butter Honey Pig Bread wins Canada Reads, I promise to send flowers to uh, Roger and his family and to cook them um, jollof rice. Everyone loves jollof rice with fried chicken and make masa using my grandmother's recipe. <laughs> if Hench wins Canada Reads, I will write Paul the fan fiction of his choice with whatever pairing, in whatever universe, with whatever specifications he likes, I will create that custom fanfic just for him. I mean, a nerd's wet dream right there. Huh? Those were the voices of this year's Canada Reads authors, C.L. Polk, Joshua Whitehead, Jessica J. Lee, Francesca Equiasi, and Natalie Zena Walshots. I should mention this. Uh, Joshua is probably not going to give uh, Devery $100,000. That is a RuPaul's <laughs> Drag Race reference. But Devery, you'll have to win Canada Reads to find out for sure. I pity those who didn't understand yeah. the reference. <laughs> <laughs> you can all go research it. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. Well, it's been uh, about a year since the pandemic began in Canada. It has been a difficult one. Reading can be a tool to help us in tough times, whether we use it to face challenges ahead uh, or face them head on or escape them for a little while. So the question is, what book at the Canada Reads table did not work for you in this moment? So, um, Roger, let me start with you. What book at this table was, uh, was not the right book for the moment? Uh, I would have to say two two trees um, because simply I, I found as much as I wanted to be transported and I have, you know, my grandfather is Chinese. I have an affinity to that region of the world and I was anticipating a great personal connection to a lot of the things, you know. I too grew up calling my grandfather Gong Gong, right? So 
I was looking for that connection, but I found that I was so distracted by the landscape explanations. Um, I couldn't get to the core of the storytelling or the core of the heart of the humanity of the, of the, the, the cast of characters. When I did interact with the cast of characters, I was fascinated, I was drawn, I was wanting to hear about the food and how they grew up and the grandfather was a war pilot and he was like celebrated and just like this very rich world. And there's uh, some cultural references that, I, that I'm familiar with, right? So I, I did feel this connection, but it took me so long to get to those moments because I spent so long walking up this mountain and learning about this well, tree. Well, let's hear from <laughs> you, Scott. Let's hear uh, your thoughts you on know, that. You know, I think in some ways I was expecting at least someone to bring that up. And, and my response to that is this book is calling for you to take a moment and take a breath and appreciate the earth. Um, and um, as much as one can go into reading this book expecting, you know, to be completely and utterly transported to a world of just humanity. That's, I don't think what this book is attempting to do. I think it's attempting to show us that the stories of our lives and the stories of this earth are intertwined. So um, I would just call for any reader to make room for that when reading this book. And um, I think that that's what, what changed me when reading it. You know, I went into this book with, with the same preconceptions about what it was gonna be. And you know, partway through it, I went, this is a this is a different thing and I'm gonna allow this book to to show me about nature and the sun and the breeze and the trees and a landscape that I've never been to and allow me to sort of to feel part of that. So Rosie, let me move on to yeah. you. Thank you for that, Scott. We're yeah. gonna stick to, uh, to, to a, a tight schedule here. So let me ask you, what book did not work for you in this moment? Um, this is um, the non-linear approach uh, at this moment did, did not work for me. I felt that it was necessary to keep things moving forward just because of the disjointed way in which we are living our lives now. Uh, things are, have been sent topsy-turvy because of uh, the pandemic stay-at-home order. So it, it, was, it was a bit of a chore, I, I would have to say, for two trees uh, make a forest. Just a bit of a chore in terms of, of the flow and the reading. When you put it down, then you come back, then you have to, I had to backtrack a little bit to reconnect myself to the story. And um, I feel that in this time, I, need, I needed to be transported fairly um, fluidly and, and easily into another world because days can be quite long or or discombobulating mm -hmm. because I'm spending all my time either in a building or or at work or coming home and the days are so short. So it was a very strange time I find this past year because of the ways in which we were living. And that was one of the problems I had. With the two trees. Okay, Devry, let me make sure we get uh, your opinion on this too, a book that didn't work for you in this moment. Definitely. Um, for me, I think reading all of the books um, and this is so hard because like all of the authors, these are their babies and they've spent so much time in them. And so I wanna be respectful first and foremost of what everybody's brought. And I have enjoyed different aspects of everybody's book, but the one that works least for me right now and this time and place is actually The Midnight Bargain. While it did transport me to another world that was really fun and like, don't get me wrong, I love a fluffy novel. Um, I think for me, if you're gonna invent a whole universe and, and a whole world, why would you transport us to a patriarchal society? Like we've already been there, we've already done that. People are, have lived through it. And um, yeah, I would have loved, I think for me, to have seen the conversation of gender inequality, but in a new take, um, where it, in my mind, I was like, I would be really interested in having this conversation if it, they were gender flipped, if Beatrice was actually uh, a man who was not allowed to practice magic uh, and had to wear a collar because that would be so jarring and would obviously be inequality of the genders, but it wouldn't be so on the nose with a conversation that I felt that we have already had culturally. Rosie, I'd like you to address that as briefly as you could about this idea of being a... Uh, yeah. No, not because you're no, no, not no, brief, no, just because no, no. I want to get Paul... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that the, the strength of the book is um, is the way in which she creates these these worlds and, and she places these wonderful Easter eggs. So it becomes layered. I, I, I think that a lot of people would have said that about Alice in Wonderland, um, you know, initially, but Alice in Wonderland is replete with complex undercurrents and 
brilliant word games. And this novel is replete with these wonderful Easter eggs. Like, if, for example, Beatrice's father confiscates a, a book that she's not allowed to read. And uh, the title of the book is uh, Philosophy of Persistence. So there's a book within a book. Um, there's these lesser spirits that are, that are so... Um, that are so uh, mischievous and yet uh, powerful as well. And then there's a greater spirit. So there's, there's, there's these undercurrents, there's a feminist theme that, are, that, that strongly runs through and there's subversive undertones. And also there's this, there's this uh, friendship that develops that's very, very unsurprising. Uh, Rosie, I have surprising. to leave it there. Hard 50 seconds for you, Paul, a book that didn't work in, for, for the moment, for right now. Yeah, right now, I, 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 so, I'm so, sorry, Scott. It's okay. Um, I, I really, <laughs> really, going, that, and I, and so Jessica too. I mean, it's it's writing a book is hard, and being critical of a book is hard too. But at the end of the day, reading Two Trees and Make a Florist, because it was so ambitious, she tried to do so much to it, and it almost felt like the book didn't know what it was doing. It was just ambitious in that way. And I did. I found myself uh, drifting a lot of times because she, the the flowery use of description of the, the nature and the environment was, was beautiful. But after a certain point, because I had no frame of reference to it and because it was just so wordy in a sense, uh, I found myself just sort of drifting and, and it was a difficult read to just try to get to the, to the meat and potatoes. Okay, we have story. to leave it there. I apologize to you guys. That is it, panelists. That is it for today's debate. What? It is time to vote. It's unbelievable every single time it happens. Already. That it happens that quickly. Ooh. One minute, it's the beginning of Canada Reads, and you're saying, I probably should have gone to the bathroom one more time, and next thing you know, <laughs> it's almost over. So you have ballots in front of you all. Please mark an X beside the book that you want to eliminate from the competition. Once you voted, Lucy Mann from the Canada Reads team will take your ballot. There are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. Be aware of that. <laughs> Which title will be the first to go? Will we say, so okay, see you, to Hench? Is the time up on the midnight bargain? Will two trees make a forest be chopped down by our panel? Will the panel find Johnny Appleseed too tart for their tastes? Never. <laughs> or will butter, honey, pig bread melt off the Canada Reads table? Those are all the puns I have for you Pigs today. Pigs don't melt, though. Pigs honey. don't melt, but honey and butter, honey and bread. You know, I've had some pretty uh, succulent, yeah, I mean, as a Muslim, I gotta keep that under my hat. Melt in your I've mouth. I've had some melt in my mouth, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you guys voted at different uh, paces there. Some of you voted quite quickly. I think you, you knew exactly where you were coming with this. Scott, I feel like you took a little bit more time and were a little bit more thoughtful about it had a lot more to consider. I did, yeah. I, uh, I do wanna say this, we, uh, we go out to, uh, to radio and to television, and we go out to the web as well, so some people may not have seen the trailers, they may have just see, uh, heard the trailers, and I think those were quite beautiful. If anybody wants mm. to see the, the trailers, a lot of hard work went into them. If you wanna watch them, you can go to cbcbooks.ca and watch the trailers for, uh, for all of these books, a wide variety of of uh, professional animators and, and, and voice. And it's all local animators, local. I believe. There was one person from uh, San Francisco, the rest okay. are uh, Ontario based, uh, but they are definitely worth looking into. I also want to tell you this, if, you are, uh, if your book does not move on today, uh, please know that you are in incredible company. Uh, over the years, over the 20 years that we've been doing Canada Reads, uh, Margaret Atwood, I, perhaps you've heard of her, she, uh, she had a book. Paul saying no, it doesn't ring a bell. The name does not ring a bell, but Mar Margaret? Uh, <laughs> Alice Munro's book, Mordecai Richler's book, oh. um, Douglas Copeland's book. Uh, there are a number of different, uh, Kamal al Soleili, number of books that, that uh, did not move on after day one. But those authors seem to have done okay for themselves. <laughs> and those people who championed them were also, uh, they've done all right as well. All right, I have the ballots in my hands. We're gonna start, we're gonna start with Rosie. Rosietta, how did you vote? I voted to eliminate two trees make a forest. Okay. One vote. With respect. Against oh two God. trees make a forest. Your respect has been noted. Scott Hellman, <laughs> how did you vote? I voted for the Midnight Bargain with much respect as well. Yeah. 
tremendous amount of respect in the circle <laughs> right now. It does feel <laughs> the way we're seated does have a real group therapy feel to it. And uh, we're on brand for that. Yeah. Scott Hellman, your vote for the Midnight Bargain is here. <clears throat> Paul Sun Young Lee, how did you vote? Sorry, Scott. I voted for two trees, make a forest. We have two tree two two votes to eliminate two trees, make a forest. One vote against the midnight bargain. Devery Jacobs, how did you vote? Uh, for the reasons that I listed, I voted against the midnight bargain. Okay. Also respect. <laughs> we have two votes against two trees, make a forest, and two trees against the midnight bargain. Wow. <laughs> Roger oh. Mooking. We didn't see that coming at all, bro. Hey. <laughs> Roger right Mooking, uh, you hinted at it, certainly. But how did you vote? I voted against uh, two trees, make a forest. That is three votes against, and that means two trees make a forest has been eliminated. All right, well, we have a few minutes left here before this, this day is over. Scott Hellman, you could have, people might say you, uh, you could have uh, seen this coming. How do you feel about this right now? <sighs> I uh, I just hope that if 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 there's anyone out there that hasn't read this book that they read it. I think it's an incredible book. Um, I think it's vital for our time that we connect to nature. I think the climate crisis is the the the, the most important issue of our age. I think this book attempts to um, understand humanity and its place in nature rather than outside of it or as a you know as something that commands it. And I think that that is in, in, in an incredible feat in and of itself. So um, I'm so proud to have backed this book. I'm really bummed that, that it lost, but, but it, it, it's a great book and it will do what it needs to do. Uh, this is a, a, a time, I don't know if Jessica is uh, listening. She was in a different she time said she zone, was but watching, she's probably so. uh, listening or Sorry. watching. So this might be a nice time for you to say something to Jessica if you'd like uh, she, to. Jessica is the best and has been so kind to me. And, um, and I think we both re recognize that this book is, um, is a special book. It is not like a book you've read. Um, and I suppose maybe the inaccessibility factor of it, I didn't see it, but I, I suppose that's, that's why we're here. But I think that's what makes the book special. So, you know, if this book can reach anybody and, and change them like it changed me, that's, that's the only thing that matters. Uh, and I think she would see that as well. Sure, and I, she had, uh, if you won, she had promised you a trip to Taiwan, but I think if you can make that happen independently. Which I'm still so going. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel like you were gonna say that. Uh, win yeah, or lose, I, I feel I like you're going to Taiwan when you can. Right, this book had that much Well, thanks, guys. Now I don't get to go to Taiwan. <laughs> uh, well, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> All in good time. All in good time. Um, you are a free agent right now, so what does that mean for the rest of the week for you? Um, I just wanna keep reiterating how much I loved this book. There were other books that I absolutely loved. Um, actually loved all of the books, um, some more than others though. And I'm excited to, you know, focus on those things and uh, and just so glad to be able to talk about books at all. Yeah. You know, so. Great. Yeah. Great. I know that uh, Roger, you were pretty, you know, you were pretty sure uh, from the beginning that two trees. And it was interesting because you said, as you see, you have this Chinese uh, lineage as well, but it was. Uh, the, the hikes and the walks, you said. Well, what I've, and, and I, I love landscape, so I, I found it really interesting to kind of Google and learn about plants and nomenclature. I, I'm actually fascinated by that, right? Yeah. But I, I kind of harken back to uh, one other writer that you may have heard of, Margaret Atwood. Yeah. In her masterclass, she says, it's the author's job to forget that you are reading. We have to leave this right there, Roger. I wanted to open this up with you, and we will do it, but the, we've got to end it right there. First elimination, always tough. Four books left. We have three votes, three eliminations to go. By the end of the week, one book will win. I'm Ali Hassan. We'll see you again tomorrow. Until, until then, read on, Canada. Seconds left to spare. I got, this is... <laughs> It's the a problem. crazy job, I get, I get interested in what you're saying. I'm going, oh, yeah, there's a job. job that I have to it's do as well. It's a crazy well. job, yeah, yeah. So we're going to go for, uh, for, for TV right now. All right, if you're watching uh, on TV or online, you'll see that uh, I'm still here, and, uh, and so are all the finalists. Nobody was able to, uh, to run away, and um, that is because we have something extra special for you that we don't have most years. We've got a little Canada Reads after show, so we'll talk about what went down today with the last 
uh, five, six minutes that we're five and a half minutes that we have here. We've got some some questions that are coming in uh, from YouTube and from Twitter. Um, maybe I'll start. I'll go right into that. I think uh, you can continue your your point. You were you were mentioning. Margaret Atwood. Yeah, right? Margaret Atwood in her master class says it is the author's primary job to forget that you are reading. And so you are going through the mechanics of this act of reading words on a page, but you are so transported and distracted by the physical act that you are taken to another place, right? And that is the primary function of an author, right? Uh, as said by Margaret Atwood, she knows a lot more about writing than I do, okay? <laughs> and I found... I was so distracted because I'm interested in landscape as well as uh, this ch this Chinese history. I was so distracted by the, the nomenclature that you mentioned a plant. It's like, well, I've never seen this plant. Well, actually, it's, he's, she says in the book that it only exists in Taiwan. Let me Google this plant. So I found myself like Googling plants and grasses and mountain ranges. And I learned a lot about Taiwan. Sounds Taiwan. like quite a sales pitch for the book. No, and I love <laughs> that about it. But at no point can I forget that I was reading. And I always was referencing something else instead of being further immersed in the book. And the moments where I could dive into the characters of the book were incredibly immersive, right? And the experience of walking through um, of the forest and up the mountain was very exp experiential, very visual. But after a while, I'm like, okay, I get it. We're walking by the mountain. I want to learn about these people, these families, the relationships, what intertwine. And again, I could never forget that I was reading a book because I had to trudge through so many of the, 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 the adventurous traverses that, that, that we're moving through, let's, right? Let's I, get to, yeah, do you have a, I I'm do, gonna get I, to some I, questions I, from Twitter and, and from online, but go ahead. Uh, for sure, I, I agree with that, that I wasn't able to forget that I was reading, but what I did really appreciate about Two Trees Make a Forest was that it was based on Gung's letter that was fragmented, that was um, written while he had Alzheimer's, and so it was like, it felt like that was the <coughs> spine of the book, and, and it almost felt like that was the, the path that I was following, and I thought that it was written exactly the way that it should have been written. Mm -hmm. I just think comparatively, like in competition with Absolutely. Canada Reads, that it was less accessible. That, that is exactly what I was going to say, and I, I think that Ultimately, there are other books at this at this table that are nonlinear and unchronological and jump around. Johnny Appleseed being one of them, um, Butter Honey Pig Bread also being one of them. At the end of Butter Honey Pig Bread, I was like, whoa, whoa, there was a lot of jumping around. But uh, I thought in this book specifically, it actually benefited the book um, because um, it, it was dedicated to a higher cause for me, which was her dedication to her her grandfather's uh, letter, her grandfather's disease, trying to see the world through his eyes and her dedication to nature. I think the beauty of this book is that nature doesn't call for us to um, follow a story. It, it, it asks us to become part of itself. And, um, and I think that's the call of the book. And I, I, I felt that I rose to that. And maybe it just didn't capture other people the way that it did me, but. As you talk about accessibility, Scott, I wanna <coughs> flip to this one question. We have two minutes left. But there's a question from an organization called Learning Commons on Twitter, and they were asking, I'll, I'll paraphrase, are there any Canada Reads um, books that are not high school age uh, appropriate? <laughs> Roger, I think you'd probably feel that yours, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Do you think your book is high school age appropriate? High school age? You know, I think it's really interesting. Um, we live in a time where there's just crazy, blinding things happening all the time. And my six-year-old daughter will say stuff to me that implies that she understands exactly what's going on better than a 42-year-old person. So I don't know if it's about saying it's appropriate or not. The kids are more ready than we give them credit for. Um, would I hand this book over to my six-year-old daughter to let her absorb it? Maybe, I, I don't know. Maybe it makes me a horrible parent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it makes me a great parent. I don't know. <laughs> How do you feel about Johnny Appleseed for high school age students? Ever? For me, for high school age students, I think it depends on the parent and like how open they are to uh, children learning about sex education and being more hands on with that. I think it's really important. I think it's a novel that I needed as a teenager, and I'm sure it's a novel that is very needed within these specific communities as a queer indigenous person or having a two-spirit person read this, I'm sure it would have helped me and it would have helped other people in this upbringing. And it's also frank about sex and it's open and, and 
Johnny is a two-spirit sex worker. We're sex gonna, work is real work. We have to leave it there, Debbie. I apologize. That is a wrap on Canada Reads today. My thanks to our panelists, Paul Sun Hyung Lee, Rosietta, Scott Hellman, Devery Jacobs, and Roger Mooking. They'll all be back tomorrow. We'll see you then. I'm Ali Hassan, and this is Canada Reads.